When you think about the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence, what are some of the ways you push yourself to think out of the box, to think differently, to think how intelligence could could have organized itself in ways very different than our understanding. What are some of the, the riddles of, of extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, I think everything's a riddle because it's, it's unknown. And uh, astronomers have a long history of predicting that if they build a new instrument to study a slightly different set of phenomena, densities, temperatures, they're going to understand X, Y, and Z. They build the instrument and they learn something they never anticipated. It's a sure. wonderful history to go back to. It may well be that way with extraterrestrial intelligence. And although we are trying to understand the physical media that we share, if we're talking about the propagation of signals, we know what the interstellar medium is, we know how it affects different wavelengths, we try and put that into our picture. But perhaps the way that we will detect the fact that someone else has technology, and that's really all we can do. Detecting intelligence at a distance is something we have no tools for. But we might detect their technology by opening up a new phase space, a new observational space for pure astronomy, and detect some wonderful astroengineering artifact mm. that we hadn't expected. As Jill says, we cannot detect intelligence directly. It's only uh, intelligence that creates a technology that's detectable. But we can start to contemplate about the forms of intelligence, um, the forms of beings that are different from ourselves. And that's one of the big challenges to try to expand uh, our range of conceptualization. One way to do it is to look at other species here on Earth. You know, as we contemplate the sorts of messages that we might anticipate, typically we have thought about visual messages pictures. And part of that is a reflection of us being very visual creatures. You know, if you look at how much of our cortex is devoted to processing visual and auditory mm -hmm. information, we're very visual, we're very hearing-based creatures. But it's possible that a creature could rely on other sensory modalities and still be able to create the technology to communicate. You know, we don't directly perceive radio signals. We have to transduce them. Well, vi vision that we see is a very small percentage it's of the electromagnetic it, Right, spectrum. right, right. And the very fact that we are primarily visual and auditory creatures really says something about the way we perceive and conceptualize something as basic as space and time. Mm -hmm. Oh, but wait a minute. We are visual and auditory because we live on the surface of a planet and we are bathed in energy from a star who, whose peak emission is in the green part of the spectrum and we have an atmosphere and we had water uh, as a pre-history, uh, the pre-evolutionary environment, which actually transmit sound quite well. So would, it's, would they're you, nothing... So would you, what's, would, what's the implication of that? That... that uh, Life as we know it is a planetary phenomenon. It's affected by the planet on which it evolved. We can expect similar, I would think, similar outcomes um, that evolution will be driven by the planetary environment of the other And, and what happens when species? we have a different environment? So do, is the implication we should expect extraterrestrials to be visual and auditory? Because what I would say is imagine a world that's a very different environment, mm -hmm. um, a very cloudy world, a world where there's a lot of turbulence in the atmosphere. And in that sort of a world, creatures may evolve um, to communicate through a sense of touch, right. through a sense of smell. So what I'm saying is we need to be open to the possibility of making contact with those sorts of creatures because it's conceivable that they could create a technology for interstellar communication even though their primary way of encountering the world is very different from ours. And so the implication of that is let's be wary of um, whether even our way of conceptualizing time and space is going to be the same as that of an extraterrestrial because their own subjective phenomenological experience may be very different if they're grounded in a different sensory modality. So, so where do you, what, what follows from that? How the, what follows from that is that, uh, first of all, we need to be very cautious if we detect a signal, there's a message in it, that we presuppose, oh, this is going to be a picture, this is going to be an right. auditory sort of message. You know, the thing that we always struggle with in SETI is to try to find analogies um, that will help us anticipate what contact will be like. And a great analogy for understanding another civilization of decoding another message is the challenge that we had of decoding Egyptian hieroglyphs. One of the greatest 
obstacles is the presupposition for centuries that every glyph stood for an abstract concept. Right. And it was what we knew to be true, what had to be true, that stood in the way, because that's not true. Sometimes those glyphs stand for individual sounds. What we need to do is continually be able to ask, is our way of seeing the world the only way? You know, Doug, I would be delighted to have the problem of handing you something to say, <laughs> tell me what this says. Um, I actually get more, uh, more uh, feedback and, and more excited about how information might be transmitted over interstellar distances, which I think takes away some of the question of how they experience their local world. They have to have something that would allow them to sense uh, large distances. And because right now what we're looking for are uh, de deliberately beam transmissions, and so therefore they would have to have the sense of wanting contact to be made. Well, I think they're going to have to know that they exist in a universe yeah. uh, for there to be any chance of there being a technology that we could detect. Things that are only useful locally are unlikely to be detectable over interstellar Let me distances. ask a, a much more rudimentary question. Uh, that is, how, how do we really know the difference between signal and noise? Because there, there, there are some very sophisticated uh, uh, kinds of numbers today which uh, have in their characteristic uh, a very com complexity, and they look almost random. Right. Or random has its own very interesting uh, algorithms and complexity theory and all sorts of things that, that, that embed within certain kinds of transcendental numbers and other kinds of numbers, mm -hmm. interesting ways of, of transmission, which are not like a Morse code. <laughs> right. Okay. So now suppose that you were an extraterrestrial engineer trying to des uh, design a signal that you could generate that would inevitably be detected by an emergent technology, someone on a different planet who was growing up and opening their eyes to the universe and exploring the world they lived in. I think you might decide to produce a signal that is almost like some other astrophysical natural phenomenon. Yeah. So it's a pulsar, or it's a signal that would be caught in the net when people build pulsar detectors. Mm -hmm. But suddenly, someday, someone might realize that this pulsar in this huge database actually glitches. It has pulsars, star quakes, but guess what? It glitches from one period to a second period and then back to the first and back to the second. Eventually, you'll know that it isn't astrophysics, it's engineering, but it will, as an extraterrestrial engineer trying to generate a signal, you'll have a certain amount of confidence that this signal will be captured by a young technology. And, and there's another factor there, that if some advanced civilization could harness in some advanced way the power of the largest sources of energy in the universe, such as pulsars, neutron stars, I mean, this is far beyond our current civilization, but with exponential growth of technology, you know, almost nothing is impossible if you go ahead t tens of thousands or certainly millions of years, which is a very small speck right. of time, that if you can harness that, and, and, and modify that, that may be one of the best me mechanisms of communication. In fact, there are in the interstellar medium free amplifiers for mm -hmm. radio frequencies. They're called masers. And a signal that is introduced on one side of a cloud of uh, molecules that actually maze at a particular frequency um, could be come out the other side extraordinarily amplified. Mm. So we spend a little time looking at That's those great. special places. Do you think about the possibility of looking for these engineering artifacts that that might be in these uh, so-called type 1 and type 2 and type 3 civilizations where the super advanced civilizations could harness the power of a sun by having some seemingly uh, uh, a natural object but radiating infrared instead of normal radiation and therefore some sort of, a, a, of, of an energy capturing thing. Is, is anything been talked about uh, along those lines? Well, certainly we talk about it a lot and we do some searches for Dyson spheres, uh, objects, stellar objects which have an infrared excess and guess what? We found stellar objects with infrared excesses and they turn out to be uh, stars that are forming with, with disks and mm, are probably forming mm. planetary systems. Um, I think actually the best way to think about this 
advanced technology and looking for it is to conduct an exquisite observational program for normal astronomy and astrophysics and to take a look at the universe in every possible way that we can. And then, just like Jocelyn Bell and the detection of the pulsars, when something anomalous comes along, don't throw it out. Don't discard it because it makes a prettier map without it. Think about whether that's some unexpected evidence of astroengineering. This is another example that the work that you do has very broad impact, but by, by forcing us to think beyond our normal way of thinking, it makes us receptive to a whole series of other ideas and forces us to think about new ways of looking at things that we may get data in about other areas th right. that we never even would have asked the question to go after in order to understand our cosmos in a greater, uh, in a greater detail. Well, Martin Harwood has an old book, a great book, called Cosmic Discoveries. And he makes this argument that we ought to have sort of a venture capital way of funding new, new instruments. As long as it's going to open up a new portion of observational phase space, we ought to fund it, even if we can't definitely say, well, it's going to answer the great question of today. In fact, opening that new volume of phase space may be the most transformational thing that we could do right now. What you guys do, and I would say what we all do in supporting you, is really pioneering, as you've, as you've said, uh, Doug, a, a multi-generational effort uh, to explore, explore the totality of reality. That's right. It's uh, very fitting that we're meeting here at the Long Now Foundation, where a time scale of 10,000 years is the sort of scale that uh, people think about. Because we're not going to probably find anyone in the next uh, year or two. This is the sort of search that we need to make a commitment over the course of many generations. And our tools will get better with time. And our ideas, I mean, there are probably a lot of different technologies that could be used for interstellar communication. We haven't invented them yet. So we need to make sure we stay around long enough to get smart enough to figure that out.